you will hear Kevin Brown asking for information about renting an apartment through an agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper, Apartments to Let in All Areas of the City. Yes, Mr Brown. Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. OK. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well, uh, prices start at £400 a month, going up to £1,000 a month. OK. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well, uh, the number of bedrooms mainly. Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. OK. Two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to 600 a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have... Uh, just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street... It's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a very nice apartment, uh, but it's £750 a month. Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, £750. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go, really. Do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, we have another one at £625 a month. £625? Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number 12B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C-O-R-N-E-L-L. -L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at 5.15. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. OK. So that'll be uh, 5.15 with my colleague Jason. Hmm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing. What do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well, uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of £60. What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr Brown. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two first-year engineering students discussing their project on devices which have been specially designed for use in developing countries. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully and decide which four planned developments are mentioned. Hi, Aileen. Thanks for coming. No problem. We've got our presentation coming up on Tuesday, so we need to get everything prepared now. Yeah. So we're agreed that we're going to concentrate on these two devices, which have particularly helped people in developing countries. Yes. And we'll present the information in the form of a table, so it'll be really clear for non-specialists. We'll have three columns, you know, using the headings we discussed in the last seminar. Okay, I've got those here. I'll make notes. So let's start with the clockwork radio and how it works. We'll obviously say how it's powered, i.e., that it's wound up. Yeah, and we'll also need to explain how the energy is stored. Okay. In a spring. Fine. Keep it simple. But we also need to say that the thing which makes the mechanism so special is the inclusion of a gearbox. You know, which makes it possible to release energy extremely slowly,、mm. and that means that it can operate for a long time with minimal effort. Okay. Now the next section is what are its benefits. I suppose we just need to emphasise that it costs a lot less than radios which use batteries, and if we want to, we can explain that these can cost as much as a week's wages in some parts of the world. Absolutely, and related to that, of course, is the fact that people don't have to depend on buying anything in a store, which in remote rural areas is really important.、Mm. And then in the developments column, I think the most important thing we need to say. Is that the combination of the wind-up mechanism with a solar cell means that during the day it runs on the sun's energy, and you only have to wind it up when it's dark, which makes it a much more attractive option. And that's probably that for the radio. Yep. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So we'll then move on to the solar box cooker. And again, let's keep the description of the mechanism very simple. We need to say that it uses sunlight rather than conventional fuels to cook food. But we also need to explain two elements of why it's so efficient. Yeah, the fact that sun's rays enter through a plastic cover.、Mm, better call it a lid. I thought it was made of glass. Mm, not according to my research.、Mm, okay. And then we just say that light is transformed into heat, and, and because it has a longer wavelength, means that it gets trapped, and so it cooks the food. Good, right. And then where do we begin on the advantages? <laughs> There's so many. I suppose we have to begin with the fact that you no longer need to cut down trees, which brings a whole raft of other benefits in its turn.、Mm, sure. And related to that, I think we need to say that because dung is no longer needed as a fuel for cooking, it can be used as a fertilizer, which leads to better harvests. And then there's the fact that there is absolutely no smoke. 
I was reading somewhere that there's a huge incidence of lung complaints, especially among women and children who have to breathe in smoke from conventional cookers. So that's another plus point. Yep. And then we need to say something about the way cookboxes have been improved. I think we can emphasise the fact that a reflector is often added at an angle to the lid to maximise the amount of light entering. Yes, good point. And also, I read about the fact that the floor or base of the box is raised, which improves heat retention. Oh, and I think we should mention the fact that many of the new boxes have a sloping or inclined lid, which increases the surface area to capture the sun's rays. Yes, that's a good point to finish on. I think. So I'll write up that table on an OHT if you like, and we're all set for our presentation. Yes, great. If there's anything else that you think we should discuss. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas. And efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals, we see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the minimum critical size of ecosystems project. Could you tell me about it? A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practicing conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated. So they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large. Something on the order of one thousand square kilometers. Now look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As the talk continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So, when fifty percent of a forest is lost, the remaining fifty percent being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that fifty percent has been lost. And this affects not just forest but species diversity, correct? 
In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes, but we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else. And those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritising refuges? Yes, it was the first time that someone looked basin-wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugian areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990 after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data, including information about the vectors of development. Roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject 
and all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and, oh, sorry, no, it was women who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.